Hey there folks, welcome to Spectrum Pulse, we talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And now on to our second list, and the one that thankfully does not give me heart palpitations whenever I have to think about it. The top 10 best hit songs of 2014. Now once again, let's go over some of our main rules. The songs need to debut on the year-end Billboard Hot 100 list in 2014. So while there are some great songs like Counting Stars and Wait Me Up that came out last year and still made this year's year-end list, they already had their shot to make the list back in 2014. 2013, so they're disqualified. They don't count. Which honestly gets a little bit frustrating because while the year-end Billboard Hot 100 list didn't have as many outright terrible songs and crap as last year, I also made the argument it didn't have as many genuinely awesome smash hits either. 2014 tended towards average all around, with only a few genuinely great songs and a whole sea of stuff that was pretty solid, but didn't evoke a huge amount of reaction from me one way or the other. And once again, this is my list of my favorite hits. The list of songs from across the entire year that never touched the charts, it's on its way, don't worry. But these are the songs that were actually popular and also had some real genuine quality behind them. And fair warning, there will be choices on this list that will surprise you and that you will disagree with. I can think of a few honorable mentions right off the top of my head right now. But let's not waste any time here. Let's get to those honorable mentions, shall we? It's going down. I'm yelling to my. You better move. You better dance. Let's make a night. You won't remember. Okay, so originally my plan was for this slot to go to Give Me Back My Hometown by Eric Church, his highest charting hit off of The Outsiders and probably one of the better songs from that album. But it got muscled off the chart by much weaker songs, so I went with the next best thing. And look, you don't need to tell me that Timber isn't better than Give Me Back My Hometown. Believe me, it's not great. And it was a narrow fight between this and a couple other songs. That said, at the end of the day, I do like Timber because it does a surprising amount right. Pitbull's rapping is better than usual for him, especially in his second verse, but this song is is really all about Kesha, who absolutely dominates it and proves that she does have legitimate pipes outside of the autotune. As for the instrumentation, the harmonica melody balances out pretty well against the clap percussion, the more rollicking vibe courtesy of the guitars, it's a nice fit, and at the end of the day, it does exactly what it's designed to do. And both artists have a ton of real charisma here, which does a lot for the song. It's a dance song with a memorable melody and sound, and I dare say it's better than most of the mainstream country tracks that were dropped this year, so <laughs> I'll take it. Now one of my harshest reviews of this year was of Sia's album 1000 Forms of Fear. And when I said in that review that Chandelier has problems, I meant it. The percussion crushes the melody into this watery slurry. The back half of the chorus can't pay off the rest of the song. The pitch correction drizzled all over the pre-chorus was definitely a mistake. And Sia just shreds her voice on the song past the breaking point. As a vocalist myself, that sounds painful. Forget her aversion to fame and touring. If she were to perform this song live on tour, her voice would be gone by midweek. Now, all that being said, the eerie off-kilter vibe of the verses, the cacophonous explosion of drums on a pretty damn powerful crescendo, and lyrics that capture that drunken desperation of a night careening out of control, it's got a certain visceral power to this song that I can't really deny. It really does frustrate me because this is one of those songs I should like more than I do. It should have been exceptional, but as it is, it's just merely good. Eh, it happens. Happens. Now when I reviewed Lady Gaga's Art Pop, I made the mistake in analysis that this song promoted all sorts of, well, questionable sexual context by implying that while her mind, heart, and soul were protected, one could do what you want with her body. Now, that wasn't quite the interpretation Gaga intended, as it's more about her love-hate relationship with the press. But then considering R. Kelly gets on the song and makes it all too literal with his verse, it's not exactly surprising there was a misinterpretation there on my part. Now, that being said, Do What You Want has held up remarkably well across 2014 thanks to a killer groove, Lady Gaga's very raw delivery, some excellent synth production, and the fact that R. Kelly is is, well, R. Kelly. He's an incredible performer, and he's all kinds of awesome here. Granted, the way he warps the subject matter through his verse is off-putting and keeps it from being higher, and R. Kelly's not exactly a good human being, but you know what? The song has it own. It deserves some recognition. I'll take it. You know, this 
this is actually a fair bit lower than I thought it would be originally, because the tighter, more personal focus in comparison with Sia's Chandelier was one of its strongest selling points for me. I liked how, despite the heavier emphasis on percussion, the strings and the ghostly voices in the melodies were preserved, the reverb emphasizing the loneliness of the narrator, and Tovlo's blunt, detailed brand of songwriting brought a lot of color to her post-breakup delirium. But as I said when I reviewed Tovlo's debut album, Queen of the Clouds, a couple months ago, it's a song that works a lot better in the context of its album than on its own, showing just how her return to her previously reckless lifestyle reveals itself as so empty and hollow now, like disposable like the Twinkie she's eating. On its own, the track raises a lot more questions than it really does answer, as her reckless behavior does imply more than just post-breakup blues, and doesn't exactly do enough to inform outside of that album context. On top of that, it's always annoyed me that the production never caught that her voice tops out during the chorus. It's a minor production quibble, it's a nitpick, I know that, but it does knock it back for me. Still, damn good song. Oh, I bet some of you are surprised to see this year, aren't you? Yeah, it's that kind of year. But you know what? I'll say this. Dirt by Florida Georgia Line would have had a solid shot at any of my lists, mostly because it's a damn good song. I'm not going to say it's all that deep. On a fundamental level, it's still a song about dirt. But to some extent... It's grounded. It's heartland-driven country music that shows that Florida Georgia Line can step up its game and write something beyond the bro country cliches that actually shows them recognizing and acknowledging their own mortality. And it helps that Joey Moy's production cranks up the steel guitars, the organs, and the more acoustic elements beyond the muddy cymbals production, giving the song some real melody, which I did appreciate. Yeah, it's still got something of a checklist nature to its lyrics, but for a tentative step towards more conceptual songwriting, Florida Georgia Line are finally on the right track. So, I'll take it. Would have followed you Say something I'm giving up on you This song really snuck up on me to the point where I only recently started getting into it in the past few months. Maybe I was put off by its bare bones composition and melody or Christine Aguilera, the latter being the only reason that the song charted at all after she offered to record her vocals to supplement them. But yeah, let me repeat what so many other music critics have said. This song is great. The emotion is potent. The bare bones accompaniment fits the stripped down, complicated pain of this song. The frustration and grief at giving up on a relationship that's failing because she's not in love in the same way that the narrator is. And even though it's the mature step to do to break up, it still hurts like hell. And I love Ian Axel's vocals, so much so that I actually wish the solo version of the song had actually done better. Christina, she's all right here, probably the most subtle that she's ever been on a song. But framing the song as a duet changes the context from solitary heartbreak to a breakup just because of failures of communication on both sides. And you know what, to me, the way it's done here, it doesn't quite work as well. Still, the song has definitely deserves a lot of the acclaim that it's got. It's a great track. Oh what, don't look at me like that. Wrecking Ball made the honorable mentions list last year, and you know what? Shower's here this year. Yeah, okay, it's ridiculously sugary teen pop, and the Call Me Maybe comparison is really an easy one to make. But unlike Carly Rae Jepsen, Becky G is actually a teenager, and the simpler framing makes this song a lot easier to like. Hell, I like this a lot more than I ever liked Call Me Maybe, because it's all about blissful young love, and for what it's trying to do, it's pretty damn enjoyable, especially from a compositional standpoint. The chorus is melodic and well written with some acoustic texture, the flutes are good on the bridge, the strings arrangement is well placed, the backing vocals are very well layered, and the crescendos are pretty damn potent. Yeah, it's intended for a younger audience, I can tell that, but who says that music for teenagers and kids has to suck? And Shower by Becky G is really better than it has any right to be. You know what? I'll take it. And now, on to the list proper. Number 10. Now, one of the entries on Billboard's year-end list for both last year and this year was Wake Me Up by Avicii, a song that I really liked but ultimately was just bumped off the list last year by a few better songs. It was extremely close, and in all due honesty, I'm not sure his highest charting follow-up song is a better track, but it's this kind of year, I'll take whatever I can get.
Now I stand by my original criticism of Avicii's debut album, True, that the folk and the country elements were far better integrated and executed than the EDM pieces. And that's certainly true here. For the longest time, this song was just not sticking with me in the slightest, because there are still some real problems with it. The underlying beat beneath the horns always felt a little bit underweight to me. The double click of the percussion didn't fit it in with the rest of the song, especially the more straightforward grooves on the acoustic guitars and the melody line and the horns. The track just didn't feel cohesive to me, and that put me off really getting into it. So, okay, why did I come along to liking this song? Well, call it a case of the really great parts outweighing the stuff I didn't like. I really like the lyrics emphasizing that family bond. I dug into Tan Timinski's vocals, which you might recognize if you're familiar at all with Bluegrass or the work that he's done with Alison Krauss, and the crescendo is incredibly solid, infusing a really solid guitar lick with a great horn melody. Hell, even the hand clap percussion works pretty well here too, and I do like that Avicii's got a knack for relying on more melodic hooks than been most in modern pop and EDM this year. In other words, it's got me curious to see more. Looking forward to that sophomore album, Avicii. Please don't screw it up. Number nine. Now this was the year the Maroon 5 wannabes arrived in force, mostly trying to take advantage of the band's watered down commercial appeal, including the new release from longtime pop rock group Maroon 5, which sounded less and less like a distinctive band and more like an Adam Levine star vehicle. But okay, putting aside a bad joke at Maroon 5's expense, this year also saw the arrival of a fair few pop rock groups like the debuting Rixton or the return of Chromio. But if there was one that's going to be a duo that sticks around, and I'm honestly not sure that they will. I actually kind of hope it's these guys, because this song was a ton of fun. Like with Hey Brother, there are a couple problems with Classic. For one, it's by far one of the most ridiculously goofy songs that came out this year, and it's coming from a duo that many would argue have no business making music whatsoever. Malcolm Kelly is a former cast member off of Lost, I mean, and Tony Allers bounced around from a couple films like The Purge to a Nickelodeon series. And really, it makes a lot of sense that they make a song like this. Overloaded with retro old school cheese, it's fully aware of how silly it is and just rolling with it anyway. That said, some of the songwriting is clumsy and forced, and you can tell these guys were reaching and really couldn't rise above making it kind of a stupid song. But that being said, there's a lot to say about the stuff that the song gets right. For one, both these guys have a ton of charisma and upbeat energy, and while I wouldn't say Kelly's voice is stellar, he possesses a lot of presence and what you need for a song like this. It also makes up for some of the lyrics that do skirt the edges of kind of being dumb, even in a rap verse that is way better than it has any right to be. The reference to Hathaway wasn't actually a result to our Les Mis Oscar winner, but actually to Donny Hathaway. It was known in jazz, blues, and soul, but it's a stretch to include Beyonce in the list of classic ladies of glamour, at least right now. Normally history is the judge of that. But you know what? Putting all that aside, there's a lot to dig out of the instrumentation too. The great squonk of the bass line, the relentlessly catchy keyboards, the punchier modern organ tone, the string section, the percussion that's a little heavier but never overwhelms the melody, and production that's just lightweight enough to make this song like this work. It's the kind of lightweight, slick pop song that goes down pretty easy, and the retro style has a enough flair to rise above. You know what? I'll take it. Good work, guys. Number eight. Last year, One Republic made a major splash in the pop scene with the success of Counting Stars, which also charted this year, and if it hadn't landed on last year's list, it would probably have a major shot landing here, too. What I and a lot of other critics appreciated is that the sign that One Republic's brand of lightweight music was evolving to something willing to take more chances or maybe get a little bit darker. I was significantly more skeptical, mostly because we're still dealing with Ryan Tedder here, a songwriter and producer who has frequently disappointed me by not being outright bad, but never really living up to a lot of his potential. Fortunately, their next single managed to prove me wrong in a big way. Now on the surface, this is the sort of pop song that would probably irk me a little bit. Abusive reverb, focus on percussion over obvious melody, but if we're looking for an easy example of how to do this song right, I'd be here. The usage of well-placed piano to match the percussion is a great way to keep the ominous tension of the song and complement that melody line. The drums have a lot of texture, the cavernous vocal production makes sense for the eerie, more primal atmosphere, where lyrics references devils by name. It seems to have taken the failure of the relationship in the future as a given. It's a song that feels huge and almost 
biblical, that matches the insane conviction of the singing, something that Ryan Tedder is very plainly aware of, which adds to that desperate feel of the song and raises questions how sane he is looking to appear in this track. Even if he does manage to win this girl over, and if he does, it's going to be by sheer force of will alone, he's actually acutely aware that it's a doomed proposition at best. But really, the reason this song has made this list is Ryan Tedder. I don't know what snapped inside him that triggered this change in his vocals, but by God, I'm a fan of it. Not only does he show off his massive range, he's actually got fragments of real raw power that takes a step towards convincing me that One Republic might actually be a decent rock band. And Ryan Tedder is throwing himself into selling the song. And while the production does mute some of the rougher edges around his voice, it still comes across as way more powerful than I would ever expect. If this is the direction that One Republic wants to take their sound towards a rougher, more raw material, yeah, okay, I'm on board. Number seven. Of all the songs that make this list, this will probably be one of the more controversial entries. It shouldn't be. It's a damn great song from one artist I really like and another I've consistently had mixed feelings on throughout her entire career. And yet, speaking objectively, it's neither artist's best work by a mile. And given a video that proved plenty controversial in its own right, I can bet there will be some raised eyebrows surrounding my inclusion of this track. But at the end of the day, God damn it, folks, it just works. Now, I've already made most of my case for this song when I reviewed Shakira's weaker than expected self titled album earlier this year, but several months later, Can't Remember to Forget You holds up surprisingly well. For one, it makes the smart decision of taking the subject matter of willingly going back to a bad relationship and then painting it like the whirlwind disaster in the making that it will be. It's a delirious relapse that comes with the uneasy feeling in the pit of your stomach that what you're doing is a horrible mistake, but god damn it, you're gonna do it anyway. That's why I love when the rock guitars kick in with the ominous minor chords for the chorus to balance out against the garish horns, the thick bass line, the echoing percussion, the reggae inspired riff. It's pure, over the top, trashy, telenovela inspired melodrama. And it knows it. It's going to have as much lurid fun with it as possible. If anybody is taking this song remotely seriously, I'm sorry folks, you're doing it wrong. And yeah, you know what? I delved the hell out of this song. Shakira is still an amazing vocalist, but the singer that surprised me most here and really stepped up was Rihanna, who actually brought up her game to deliver a more sultry, emphatic performance that reminds me how much I really like it when she kicks in her more dominant side of her persona. She and Shakira are a surprisingly even match on the song, and their interplay, it's not bad. I certainly prefer it more to when Shakira and Beyonce collaborated on Beautiful Liar seven years ago. A song that has aged really badly, was way too stiff, and did nothing to compliment either singer. And yeah, forget the video. The song on its own is sexy as hell, and there's nothing wrong with admitting that as a positive when it's so obvious that was the intention. Not quite as sexy as Ariana Grande and The Weeknd's Love Be Harder, which will be absolutely huge next year, but you know what? It still works. I'm not going to defend this song by saying it's high art of any sort, but for what it's trying to do, it nails it. Damn near perfectly. Great song. Number six. I tend to be a little bit skeptical of songs that drag real world relationship drama into their music. Well, it's because it's rarely presented with the sort of good framing that needs to work. For as much as Eminem has brought up Kim or Drake has brought up Rihanna, it's rare that we get both sides of the story on the same track or an acknowledgement that the singer might have some culpability and why things don't work. Taylor Swift is the queen of these sorts of songs. And while her framing has gotten better and she did write back to December, the song where she basically pleaded with Taylor Lautner to take her back, there's a fine line here and some of her material treads into the cattier side that just doesn't go down well for me. I've got a natural aversion to tabloid drama and when artists actively get involved in it themselves with their art and their music, it rarely looks good for anybody involved. Thankfully, I think Ed Sheeran understood that when he wrote this song. You know what, I've really warmed up a fair bit to Ed Sheeran over the course of this year. And while I didn't really like Sing, Don't is the sort of songwriting that I want to see more of in pop music, especially from him. Telling of his failed relationship with fellow pop singer Ellie Goulding and how she cheated on him with Niall from One Direction. In other words, this is the sort of gossipy tabloid nonsense that I should despise. But Ed Sheeran doesn't so much take the high road as he just drops all the facts on the plain view. It was a relationship for all the wrong reasons right from the start. And I think he gets that it was doomed right out of the gate because 
nobody was being straight with each other. And Ed Sheeran gets that and doesn't shy away from his own culpability and not reading the signs or getting involved in a relationship, given how much they were touring in opposite directions around the world. It's not even the song slamming her. Sure, the cheating and her showing up crying at his hotel afterwards doesn't exactly play in a flattering picture, but the song isn't really about that so much as it just being honest and communicating these relationships, and I can definitely get behind that. It also helps that it's probably one of the best examples of Ed Sheeran's vocals and instrumentation to date. The dusty percussion, the echoing guitar leads, the stripped back strumming, the grimy production, the subtler, darker guitars coming in at the back of the mix for the third verse. There's this tightness and attention in the song that does wonders to reflect the confusion and the frustration and the barely restrained anger of Ed Sheeran's voice. There's a lot of really subtle emotions that play through the song that make it come across as surprisingly human, with nobody really being the villain here. And while it's not Ed Sheeran's best song, when you've written tracks like Lego House and A Fire Love, you set yourself an impressively high bar. It's still really complicated and dark for a mainstream pop song. And if it's a sign that if Ed Sheeran's gonna be sticking around, it's a good thing, and the charts will definitely be better for it. Number five. Last year on my year end list of the best hit songs of 2014, I made two predictions, both of which came true this year to my absolute delight. The first, well, just release Team as your next single. Let that gain some swell. I like that song. Yeah, it happened. Royals was the song that established Lord, but Team is the track that turned her into a goddamn superstar. Much of the way that Can't Hold Us turned Macklemore into that household name. And like that song, it's about defining a new paradigm for pop music, shredding the old school exclusionary brand of glamour into something that's more inclusive of everyone, regardless of their appearance or their background. And yet she doesn't want to be the figurehead of that revolution like on Royals, which is a nice touch and shows remarkable self-awareness of how such movements can absolutely devour and destroy their own leaders. The song writing is intelligent, impressively detailed, and shows both her age and wisdom beyond her years. And it actually kind of answers some of the biggest criticisms that I had about Lord's debut album, Pure Heroin, where her revolution didn't really have an end goal beyond simply change. But then again, all she's looking for is a more inclusive system. And while it's a very simple dream and a pretty minor change, it's kind of effective here. Oh yeah, and the actual song itself is great too. Taking a much more melodic approach against the thick, punchy beat with these great shimmering synths with Lord's delivery just being very weird yet very hopeful as well. It also helps that multi-tracking is very tightly placed, giving the song a feeling of muted elegance that shows Lord could very well be the queen with gravitas and maturity behind her, but not forcing her towards that role. And while the lyrics are the real star of the show on this song, it's easily Lord's best work thus far, and I'm absolutely thrilled that this song was a huge hit. Looking forward to that second album from you, Lord. We need more singer-songwriters like Pop, like you. Number four. Oh, I don't know how I'm gonna explain this one. I mean. I'm gonna try, but ugh, look, just go with it. I have heard every single criticism of this song. Hell, I've made plenty of criticisms of this track myself. Is it dumb as hell? Absolutely. Is it lightweight beach fodder made by an artist capable of far better? You bet your ass it is. Is it overproduced and way too electronic courtesy of Joey Moist production? Oh dear God it is. Is Jake Owen's laid back pseudo rapping of the verses completely ridiculous? You bet your ass it is. But yeah, even after I reviewed Days of Gold last year, I kept coming back to that album and this is one of the songs that landed on semi-permanent rotation with me. Sort of percent many of the reasons that I like Toes by the Zac Brown Band or Five O'Clock Somewhere by Alan Jackson and Jimmy Buffett. They're lightweight beach songs that aren't trying to be deep or substantial. It can still work on their own merits. And I'd argue that beachin' really does work. The majority of it is a factor of the chorus. It's sticky, incredibly memorable, extremely melodic. It's the perfect thing for a summer jam in the variety that picks up all the textures of the beach resort that Jake Owen is inevitably staying on. And really, in the hands of a less charismatic singer-songwriter, none of this would work at all. Let me stress that. But Jake Owen is really that good of a performer to string it together with something that's memorable and infectious and fun. It's honestly kind of amazing how much his lazy drawl works because it's clear that he's having fun on the beach and we all should be too. Now, this is not a song that's substantial or has any real weight or power behind it, not by a long shot, but it does exactly what it's designed to do and it's a ton of fun for it. It's a sign of what dumb bro country can be at its absolute best. And you know what? There's a place for that. It's a very small place, let me stress this, but a place all the same. 
I'll take it. Number three, there's certain songs I hear the second I finish listening, I hope to God the band chooses to make it a single and then it gets the push to mainstream radio. And it's rare that the song catches on, but deep down, I hope that it manages to click into something primal and just work for that audience. It's really rare this happens. I can look back at plenty of Hot 100 charts over the past decade and there's a long list of songs, usually indie rock or electronica or hip hop that's off the beaten path just a little and they just end up missing the cut. And we'll get to one of those later on in this list, but this one didn't just missed the cut it was a smash hit and as i said last year and like how pompeii by bastille will explode next year watch it it's coming up yeah folks this one was really earned but if you close your eyes does it This was the second prediction I made, and oh dear god, I'm so happy this turned into a hit. I remember reviewing Bastille's debut album, Bad Blood, and liking but not really loving it. But Pompeii was great from the get-go and an early favorite of mine. And guess what? It's still a fantastic song that shows exactly what Bastille can do when they are on their game. Dan Smith has a lot of potent vocals, the Gregorian chorus behind him fits the larger-than-life vibe, the percussion is explosive, especially the kick drum and progression, and the interwoven bass harmonies are absolutely awesome. And in a year where so many songs like this would be drowned out in reverb to sound bigger than they are. Bastille got there the organic way with real presence and epic crescendos that they can actually pay off. That's something that actually happened in pop music this year. I'm so glad. Of course, the element of the song that has attracted the most discussion has been the lyrics, which reportedly take place from two long dead corpses in the ruins of Pompeii, musing on the nature of life and how one reacts when facing disaster that is so much larger than oneself. Perhaps a bit of an overwrought metaphor in the context of relationships, but in facing of what many of the time considered the wrath of the gods upon a city of sin, it's kind of appropriate here. It's rare that you see songs this high concept on the pop charts. And though Bastille has struggled to get that second hit in the United States, I have to hope that their crossover and influence will actually manage to stick around. Fantastic song. Great job, Bastille. Number two. I was really surprised the song clicked with me as much as it did. See, I remember when the first hit dropped back in 2012. And I, while I respected the artistry of the song, I was underwhelmed by the execution. It wasn't as if the song was bad. It just never really clicked with me in the same way that it did with so many other critics. And arguably, this is a less refined song than that one is. Is. And yet, for some reason, it's all the more powerful for it, and it landed on this list. I'm a little bit at a loss to describe why I love Burn as much as I do. The lyrics are not stellar if you look at it objectively. They, I mean, they evoke incendiary power and the build-up to the song is impressive, but this is not exactly a song that evokes deep thought. And to be fair, I'd argue that wasn't its point. Burn is the sort of song that was designed to create sweeping, potent emotion. From the opening heavy synth to Ellie Goulding's drive to create a surging well of power with more voices added to her multi-track vocals. And there are so many subtle accent touches to this track that I absolutely love. The softer keyboard interweaving in the verses, the punchy, explosive presence of the drums, the twinkling of the bridge that translates into this simple, unearthly piano line that builds to another fantastic multi-part crescendo. Great moments here, but there are two factors to why this song just works as well as it does. The first being Ellie Goulding herself. This song was originally intended for Leona Lewis, but it would have been oversold from her, as Ellie Goulding is the sort of pop star who seems to bring a sense of real honest wonderment to her music that I just find incredibly charming. And the second part, is the bells. They come in on the pre-chorus and they are that element that just raises the song over the top for me. A simple pop song to be sure, but one exceedingly well crafted all across the same. I might not have loved lights, but burn is just something special for me. It just kicks all amounts of ass. And yet, there was one song that was better, one that for the longest time this year I didn't think would have enough to swell to actually manage to make this list. And yet, number one. I can imagine that some of you will look at this pick, look back at last year, and just roll your eyes. I mean, it's a little bit obvious, isn't it? Of course the pretentious music critic is gonna go for this song. Given his preferences, of course it's gonna be number one. But I'd warn anyone looking for patterns on these lists. In 2011, my favorite hit song of the year was Colder Weather by the Zac Brown Band, a pure neo-traditional country song that holds up even to this day. It's amazing. 2012, it was So Good by B.O.B., a Ryan Tedder produced bit of lightweight hip hop that took the overall trappings of luxury rap and added some real culture behind it in a way I found incredibly charming. But while there are some years where my picks might be unpredictable, anybody who knows me or has followed my Twitter feed this year and knows that what has charted will not be surprised by this pick at all. 
because it's awesome. When I first heard the song, I couldn't believe it was actually charting on mainstream radio, and for a while it didn't. Originally released in 2011, only now breaking in the United States, an indie rock song from South Africa featuring prominent accordion, groove heavy guitar leads that were frequently inverted, a grimy steel guitar solo, and some of the most rough edged vocals you will hear in mainstream music this year, and yet it just works incredibly well. Inspired by South African jazz and house music, forming the sort of swampy, decaying brand of sound you'd hear from an act like Tom Waits, with the eclectic instrumentation and an eerie as hell atmosphere. This is dark, twisted music that could easily be described as hellish, especially when you take a look at the lyrical content. And you know what? The metalhead deep inside me outright rejoices because this is a song that so aptly captures the vibe of someone unsteadily stepping towards the pit of their own free will. The fact they can do that is impressive. On the surface, this is a song about losing control, breaking out of conformity formed by cultural assimilation, one's own insecurities, and the continuous encroach of time. And yet, that said loss of control will come at a dark price. The most memorable line at the end of the second verse is there. I tried to sell my soul last night. Funny, he wouldn't even take a bite. And that's because the devil, he doesn't need to take a bite. When the narrator is already on the brink and ready to tumble down into that darkness. Perhaps he was already damned from the start and he just needed that final push. And I love that the song illuminates that through this washed out interlude. Followed up with a steel guitar solo, an accordion solo, and one of the most cacophonous explosive recaps of the first verse that I have heard all year. You don't hear songs this rough edge, groove heavy, high concept, and dark on mainstream radio anymore. The fact that this was a hit at all is mind blowing, especially years after the album was the release. Hell, with the success of this and Hosier's Take Me to Church, we'll likely land a spot on next year's countdown. Mark my words, maybe the pop charts are finally ready to let some darker edged rock back on the charts to push the gauntlet a little bit further. As it is, Come With Me Now by Congos kicks all amounts of ass, and it's easily my favorite hit song of 2014. Let's hope that 2015 can rock this hard. As it is, I'm Mark, you're watching Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.